I'm Bill O'Donnell and welcome to another program on spirituality. Uh, today in the studio I'm thrilled to have finally as my guest uh, Dr. Fran Renda from New York City who has come to Santa Fe to teach at the Santa Fe Institute for Spirituality on St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, one of our favorites here in Santa Fe and at the Institute for Spirituality. So it's a blessing to have you here Fran, welcome. Thank you Bill. I say finally because uh, Dr. Renda came here uh, several years ago and sadly she had just arrived when she got news that her mother had passed away and that she had to go back so we didn't have the same presentation and brother Brian uh, labored in, uh, in his way and we, we did do a program on Therese unfortunately he knew but then you came back last year and just blew us away with uh, some wonderful presentations and it was a, just a great experience so it's great to have you here. Thanks. Again. Uh, saint Therese is, uh, as I said, a very a fam very famous saint. Uh, she's a doctor of the church. Uh, her relics came through uh, New Mexico back in 1999. Mm -hmm. And you were instrumental, weren't you, in bringing those yes, here? Yes, I was. It's great. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, for the folks at home, let's get to know you a little better and tell us about where you're from and where you grew up and how'd you get to be a uh, psychoanalyst? I come from New York City, born and raised in New York City. And um, I was a teacher for many years. What and did you teach? English. Uh. English, psychology, and religion. And the more I taught, the more I realized that the emotional life of the adolescent that I was teaching really was not the focus. And so I decided to go back to school and learn about the emotional life and to really focus on that. And so that's how I became a psychoanalyst. And so after about 20 years of te uh, 12 years of teaching, I went back to school and became a psychoanalyst. What did you have to study to become an analyst? It was 12 years of psychoanalytic theory. And where did you train? In Manhattan. And um, I am a licensed child psychoanalyst, child and adolescent, an adult psychoanalyst family uh, and couple therapist. So I cover the gamut. What is your practice like today? Or how has it evolved? Over the years it's evolved in, in interesting ways. Seventh Avenue, the fashion industry has been a focus. Um, we won't get into that, but that's where we are. Okay. Um, the theatrical industry has been a focus. and. Um, Many people in New York City who struggle with issues like all of us. You know, family issues, uh, work issues, couple issues, marital issues. How to raise a family and um, how to be a parent and work at the same time. Very much like Therese. Therese's mother also worked and struggled with how to be a parent and how to work at the same time. When did Therese live? 1873 she was born and she was 24 when she died. She died in 1897 in Normandy, France, Lisieux to be exact. How did you get attracted to Therese? It's a very interesting story. I never really knew um, my relationship with Therese, how it ever evolved. She's as real to me as you are. She's very, very real. And as a child, I read as much as I could. Um, but I never really understood how, why she was such a presence in my life. And through the years, I um, eventually contacted a kindergarten teacher that I had, uh, an old nun. And she said to me that um, when I was in the kindergarten, she would put me on her knee and bless me with the St. Therese relic every day. Don't you remember that, Francis? Mm. I said, no, I had no memory of that at all. Tell the folks at home who don't know what a relic is, what was that? There are several different kinds of relics. There's a first class relic, which is a body part. There's a second class relic, um, 
which is something that's been touched to the body of the person that has is deceased. So um, the relics that came to New Mexico and have been around the world are first class relics. It's Therese's body. Therese knew that her body would not stay intact after she died and her body would uh, disintegrate like most of ours. And so um, those relics are around the world and affect people in a very major way. I know in my own experience, I think it was a January morning, a Monday morning mm -hmm. in January, it was cold, and I couldn't believe it got down to St. Francis Cathedral where they were, the place was packed. Yeah. You could not get in, the line formed around the corner, and people didn't realize it was going to be so full, and they'd have to stand outside and wait, and it was a real problem uh, to get in, uh, but I, I didn't know what to expect to go uh, to venerate uh, a relic of a, of a saint that had been gone for almost, it's been gone over a hundred years, mm -hmm. hasn't she? Mm -hmm. and, and the effect it had on people. Can you explain it? Well, people have, have said, isn't this a strange phenomena to go and venerate a relic, the body of someone who's deceased? And actually, that has never been the focus. The focus really is Therese who focuses us or refocuses us on Christ, on God. Huh? That's the focus. So when we go to meet Therese, she kind of says to us, it's not me, it's him. And I'll teach you what I know about him. So that's the focus of a relic and going to visit a relic and venerate a relic. Tell us about her life and how she grew up. Well, as I said, she was born in 1873 in Normandy, France. She was born an upper middle class family. Her mom and dad were um, two individuals that had uh, really wanted to be religious, and both of them, for different reasons, were rejected from um, applying. The father, because he didn't have Latin, and the mother, because she never really understood why, but they just said she wasn't really for religious life. And so both of them met on a bridge in Alençon, France, where they were living. The mother owned uh, a lace business. The father owned uh, jewelry and watchmaking business. And they were married and had nine children. Therese was the last of nine. Five daughters survived, four children four other little infants, two boys, two girls died. And uh, Therese then had a very happy first four years of her life, and her mom died when she was four of cancer of the breast. One of the things that's very interesting about Therese is that she had an experience like all of us. Her mother died of cancer. Her father died of Alzheimer's. Um, she lived with uh, a maid that was an alcoholic. Her sister Leone was um, a child that was physically and emotionally abused by the maid in the house. So Therese had many of the experiences that we live with and struggle with today. The happy part of Therese's life is that she overcame a great deal of that. However, after her mother died, Therese became very depressed. Uh, for obvious reasons. She's been called spoiled, but if you really know the symptoms of depression in a child where there's been death in the family, especially a parent, they have tantrums. They have separation problems. Therese was a school phobic. She couldn't go to school. She was afraid. You know, when a child, a, a parent dies, the child is afraid that if they go to school and leave the house, maybe something else will happen. Maybe another parent will die. So Therese was homeschooled. But on one Christmas evening, uh, it's called the Christmas miracle in her life story, she came home from midnight mass with her family, and uh, she was waiting to open her, what we would have in America, a stocking filled with candies and toys. In France, they had a shoe at the fireplace. And she heard her father saying, well, thank God this is the last year we're going to do this. Yeah. And um, she 
did what she would normally do. She ran up the stairs and started crying and having a tantrum and she got to the top of the stairs and she realized, she said, I had an instant conversion. God gave me the grace to understand that this life was not about me. And so immediately she said, she ran down the stairs and she decided she was going to make the best of this. And although she was hurt and upset, she went over to her dad, she gave him a kiss and a hug, and she opened her little shoe with candies and toys. But it was from there that she understood that life was not about herself and not about focusing on her selfish needs, but about giving. Mm. How old was she at that time? Seven. Wow. That's mm -hmm. quite young, isn't it? Yes, it was. Now, she was raised a Catholic? She was raised a kid, very Catholic very in Catholic. a very Catholic house, so, household and family. So the family was active in the church. They were going to Mass regularly. And very active. The father and mother went to the 530 peasant Mass every morning. And uh, Therese was too little to go, but she would stay at home and she would do the praying or they would bring her home some bread where she could um, feel like she was receiving the body of blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. And so what else was going on at that time? Can you set the stage? What was it like in France? I mean, of course, it's going to be traumatic for her as a young child. Her mother dies. Very and traumatic. How old was she when her father died? Was that later? She was in the convent when oh, her father was. died. So what, Equally traumatic. What year was it that she decided to, or she got the call to religious life? She was 14, and she, Therese always knew that she was going to be a nun. But what happened was, her sis when her mother died, uh, Therese said to her sister Pauline, I would like you to be my mother. And so Therese felt, okay, now I have a second mother, and I could also go into the convent with Pauline when she goes into the convent. Well, that's not what happened. She overheard Pauline say she was going to leave the convent in a few months. This happened when Therese was about 11. And so Therese had a major, fell into a major, major depress depression. She was very, very upset that she was going to lose her second mother. And so um, that lasted for a short period of time, a couple of months. And what happened with that was Therese was in bed uh, one day and really very upset. And she was praying with her sisters and she looked at the Blessed Mother and the Blessed Mother, the late, uh, there was a statue in the room and the Blessed Mother smiled at her. And she realized at that point she had a new mother. She was replaced, the Blessed Mother had replaced Pauline. Tell us about that, because when a, when a statue, when you perceive that a statue is doing something other than being a statue, uh, what is that called, or what, what is that phenomena? Well, we could call it a miracle. Uh -huh. um, however, whether it actually, and the sisters always said whether it actually happened, or whether in, in her psyche, she understood that she was going to replace the mortal, you know, relationships mm -hmm. with the eternal relationship. She could never lose the Blessed Mother. Mm -hmm. The Blessed Mother would always be there for her. Christ would always be there for her. She felt healed. She felt immediately healed by that feeling of taking on the eternal love of the Mother of Christ. So that's one of the benefits of having religious artifacts, I guess, around your home, isn't it? I would say so. <laughs> I would say so. So Therese always felt that she was going to become a nun uh, ever since she was three. But when she was 14, she decided she was going to go into the convent and uh, had been promised that she'd be accepted into the convent. But once she made, uh, tried to make entrance, the bishop of the diocese said she was too young and the prior said she was too young, and so Therese and her dad went to Rome. And Therese was strong enough and very gutsy, and she was going to ask the Pope whether she could enter Carmel. And um, she went up to, she was told she was not able to speak to the Pope. She would just be able to go up to him and kiss his ring, and that was it. And um, she went up to him, and she burst out with her request. She wanted to enter Carmel. And he said to her, do what they tell you to do. Very much like the Blessed Mother had said to the, those at the wedding of Cana, do what he tells you to do. And so she waited, and she was very disappointed. 
But by the time she got back, she was given permission to enter in a few months, and she did enter. Mm -hmm. And why Carmel, as opposed to any other religious order? Therese wanted to be in a contemplative community. She wanted to be alone with Christ. Mm -hmm. She wanted to love this God that she had an intense feeling with. She wanted to love him solely. She didn't want to be distracted with anything else but a total focus on him. Mm -hmm. And so how do we get to know about Therese today? What, how is it that we are now affected by her? And the fact that she became a, one of the very few women doctors of the church, can you explain that? She was made a doctor of the church in 1997 by Pope John Paul II. He had made two other women doctors of the church, St. Teresa of Avila and St. Catherine of Siena. He had a great devotion to Therese. Mm -hmm. um, Pope John Paul II has a, had a Carmelite spirituality, and he was very devoted to Therese. But he understood the spirituality. The spirituality of Therese is um, a contemporary. It's very contemporary. It's very focused on the here and now. It's focused on. Um, a, it's focused on love. She came to understand she could have been, she says in her autobiography, I, she was an adolescent when she's writing, she said, I think I'd like to be a martyr. I think I'd like to be a doctor of the church. I think I'd like to be a priest. I think I'd, she goes through all these options and then she says, I've, I think I've come to what I'd like to be and I, what I'd like to be in the church is love. I'd, I'd like to be in the heart of the church, the heart that beats love. And so the spirituality of St. Therese is really about focusing on how to love, how to have an intimate and passionate relationship with Christ. Mm. It might be helpful for those out there who don't understand what a doctor of the church is. Can you explain to them what a doctor is in the church? I'll try. A doctor of the church is one who has a, a spirituality that's universal, that could be practiced all over the world, by everyone and anyone. It's a universal concept of relating to Christ, uh, relating to God. Mm -hmm. If you've just joined us, we're talking with Dr. Fran Renda, a psychoanalyst from New York who is currently in Santa Fe, New Mexico, to teach at the Santa Fe Institute for Spirituality on St. Therese of Lisieux. It might be good to show them. You have a copy of her autobiography. If you just hold it up, the camera can show it to the camera uh, where it is. Can you see that? Okay. When Therese was 23, she was a mimic in, and a comic in the community. And one evening she was talking about her family life and one of her sisters who was in the community with her, Pauline, said to her, I would like you to write your life story. I'd like you to write all of these memoirs that you're talking about. Therese understood that, but she wrote, instead of her entire family life, she wrote a spiritual journey, and she called it Story of a Little White Flower, and later on it was called Story of a Soul. This is the book that's been translated into 70 languages after the Bible. It's the most widely read spiritual book worldwide. Okay, thank you. You're so we can heartily recommend that to our, our viewers. Um, what is it that you've benefited from when you, when you think back on the years you've been devoted to her for how many years? 60. And she's been that big of an influence on you. Tell us how she's touched you. To go back to what I said, Therese's message is to be love in the heart of the church. It's a constant refocus for me to look at my relationship with God and to understand the limitations that I have be, being a loving person. You know, whether that's with people in my life or with this grand, great relationship that one should have with our Lord. And part of her miracle, part of her, her message, part of her revolution is that she speaks of merciful love. And I tried to understand what merciful love was. We hear of God's mercy, but I never really understood what that meant. And I struggled and studied to try to understand what mercy is. 
merciful love. And she says right in the first paragraph of the book that what I want to speak about in this book is the mercies, I'm going to sing the mercies of the Lord. And I thought, well, this is really important. I mean, we should really understand what are the mercies of the Lord. And I came to an understanding that our love is very conditional. Our love is very conditional. And um, there's what we call a friendship love. And so I love you because um, I'm attracted to you, you're interesting, um, we have things that we have in common, but I could also take my love away from you because you hurt me, you betray me. But our Lord's love, merciful love, is very different. Mer merciful love is a love that we really find even hard to comprehend, and that's after we, everybody else has rejected us, after everyone else has understood us to be very broken and very limited, very sinful, God comes in and says, now I really love you. Now, after we see that you're totally despicable, now I really love you. So it's a different kind of love. And that's what Therese's revolution is, to get us to understand that the God of vengeance and the God of punishment doesn't exist. The God of love exists. The God of mercy exists. And that's a God that loves us no matter what. That's the revolution of Therese. Your comments remind me of, of what have come to be known as the highest commandment, which are found in the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, which is to love with your whole heart, yeah. love with your whole soul, and love with your whole mind. How does that compare or how does that fit in with Therese? In the book, Story of a Soul, she speaks about love, and she's continually looking at herself. She says to you, basically, like St. Paul, look at me, and I'll teach you how to do it. And so she says, she comes up with a, a philosophy, a spirituality of what she called the little way. Love for her was not going to be, I'll say a rosary today or I'll go to Mass today, or I'll say I love you today, one thing. huh? For her, love is continuous. It's every minute of every day. It's every minute of every day. So what she does is she accesses holiness for the common folk. You could love God cleaning the house. You could love God taking care of the children. You could love God going back to when she was living. You could love God. Um, being a farmer in the fields. It's a constant love. Everything is offered up as an act of love. And she says, if you can't do that, and what she was relating to is if you were sick in bed, if you can't do that, then offer up your smile. And if you can't do that, offer up your breath. Offer your breath as an act of love. But every minute of every day is love. So you're loving this God every minute. It's not a limited thing. It's a continuous. So she, what she really says to us is, she says to me continually is, try to understand where you are in your understanding of your own love. And that's love of God or love of the people that are in our lives. If people want to come to the Institute for Spirituality, you're going to be teaching for a week there from yeah. a Sunday night through a Friday, what would people uh, come, what would they come and find if they came to the program? I would hope that they would come to understand love and they would seek inside of themselves an understanding of where they are and how to grow in love. As I'm speaking, I'm thinking of what Therese, she was 12 years old and she was um, forbidden in those days women did not read the newspaper and she was forbidden to read the newspaper but she had heard the buzz around town that a man by the name of Pranzini had murdered and raped three women and she was fascinated by this and she heard that he was going to go to hell and that the priest had um, 
offered him the sacrament of reconciliation. They had, and he had kicked and spit at them, and he wanted nothing to do with them. And she kept saying, but I know God loves him. I know he's going to heaven. I know no matter what merciful love is, he's going to be loved into heaven. So she stays up the night praying, and she says to God, I know that you love him, and I know you're going to take him into your arms, but could you give me a sign? And so the next morning, she reads in the newspaper that Pranzini had gone to the gallows, but as he did, a priest offered him a crucifix to kiss for the umpteenth time, and when he did, Pranzini grabbed the crucifix and kissed it. And she said, I understood then that God loves, and that even though this man had committed the most unbelievable crimes, that he would be loved. That's amazing. Mm. Well, that's a good message for us uh, to think about mm -hmm. in our lives. Where are we falling short? Where are we missing the opportunity to love not only ourselves, but those around us, and to forgive, I and guess, forgive. those who have harmed us. Well, this time has gone by so fast, Fran. I want to thank mm -hmm. you for coming in. Okay. I encourage you who are watching to watch the credits. Uh, Fran's phone number and address will be in the credits for you to call, or you can call the Santa Fe Institute for Spirituality at 505-473-6390. And to find out more information about the Institute for Spirituality and to uh, perhaps hear more of what Fran has to offer. And I think she would probably want you to watch, to read this book, if you can, The Story of a Soul, the Autobiography of St. Therese of Lisieux, for yourself so that you can mm. be inspired to find out how to bring more of that love into your life and in your family and friend's life. So in the minute we have remaining, what else would you like to share? It's really great to have you. I think reading Therese, understanding Therese, also helps us grow in, in our own emotional life and our own relationships. It uh, helps us to grow. We grow in love and loving the people in our own lives. Mm -hmm. I ask you to come. I would love you to help or grow with us. Okay, thanks. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank thanks. you for coming. And I hope that what Fran has said have been of some value to you and that you can benefit from the lives of the saints, particularly in this case, St. Therese of Lisieux. And uh, we hope that this show has been of some value to you. We hope to hear from you. If it has been, uh, our numbers in the credit, we'd like to hear from you. So on behalf of everybody here at Spirituality TV, our marshal, our director, Tom and Wendy, our camera people, George in the technical area and all those behind the scenes, I want to thank you, especially you, Fran, for coming Thanks, and sharing. Fred. So it's been our pleasure to have you here today. Please stay tuned next week at this time for another program on spirituality.